Thank you. The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, do you agree that every victim of sexual harassment should be fully supported? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I believe that very strongly. Uh, and when any victim of sexual harassment considers uh, that that has not been the case, uh, then whatever organisation is involved should reflect very seriously on that uh, and make any necessary changes. Uh, that is how I intend uh, to proceed as far as any issues relating to the SNP uh, are involved here. Douglas Ross. If everything the First Minister has just said is true, and she really believes that victims of sexual harassment should be fully supported, why is Patrick Grady, one of her MPs who has been found guilty of sexual harassment, still got the backing of the First Minister? First Minister. Well, I have already been clear about these issues, and I am uh, certainly very willing to be so again today. Uh, Patrick Grady's behaviour uh, was wrong. Um, I have said this uh, before. I, again, I will repeat it. I am very sorry that a member of uh, the Westminster SNP group staff uh, was subjected to an unwanted sexual advance. Um, it should not have happened, um, and I think it is important to be very clear about that. Uh, Patrick Grady's behaviour was investigated by an independent process, uh, an independent process that all parties in the House of Commons, uh, as I understand, are signed up to. Uh, the findings of that independent process were, of course, published, as is right and proper, and a sanction was imposed, a sanction that was recommended by that independent process uh, and replicated uh, by the SNP Westminster Group. Uh, in this situation, uh, there is also clearly uh, a victim uh, who feels that they were not uh, properly supported uh, in that process. Indeed, uh, the uh, victim in this case uh, believes that the process exacerbated uh, the trauma that was experienced, and I think it is absolutely incumbent uh, on any organisation in that position uh, to take views of that nature uh, very seriously. And as I have already said before today, and I have already said this today, uh, that is a matter that the SNP must and will reflect on. Uh, Ian Blackford, the leader of our group at Westminster, has already confirmed an external review of the Westminster group uh, processes, and I think that, again, is right and proper. Uh, the last thing uh, I would say, uh, Presiding Officer, is this. I, I take these issues uh, very seriously. Um, it is incumbent on me to do so. Uh, but these issues are not unique to the SNP. All parties have faced these issues, and at times all parties have been criticised for their handling of these issues. Uh, all of us have lessons uh, to learn. Obviously, I am only responsible in a party political sense for the SNP. Uh, but all of us in the society we live in uh, have lessons to learn, and it is incumbent on all of us to do so. And for my part, uh, I am determined that that will be the case. Douglas Ross. There was a ruling and a sanction from the independent complaints and uh, grievance system within the UK Parliament, but that sanction does not have to be the same adopted by the SNP Parliamentary Party at Westminster. Patrick Grady has served just two days' suspension from the SNP at Westminster. Two days is an insult. Mm -hmm. Throughout this process, the victim has been disregarded. So I hope the First Minister listened to what he had to say this morning. The victim feels betrayed. He said that Patrick Grady and Ian Blackford tried to take advantage of me being young and inexperienced. They did the bare minimum of investigation. He described his life as a result of this ordeal as torture and a living hell. Most depressing of all, he said that the SNP are punishing any victim of this sort of behaviour and punishing anyone that has come forward with a similar complaint as mine. This morning, he also said there are lots of questions for the First Minister to answer as well, and he made it clear they are not getting answered. He said, and these are the victim's words today, I would like to see Nicola say more on the subject. So will the First Minister now tell the victim what was her reaction on hearing the leaked recording where Ian Blackford encouraged SNP MPs to support the guilty party 
instead of the victim. First Minister. Hey, well, let me say, first of all, um, in relation to the victim in this case, um, some days ago, in fact, I have already in a written uh, message said sorry uh, directly uh, to them. Uh, I have also confirmed uh, my willingness uh, to meet uh, directly and personally uh, with the victim in this case. Um, when, uh, as I hope it will, uh, that interaction takes place, uh, I will say uh, sorry in person. Uh, it is not my uh, behaviour uh, that uh, was investigated, but I am leader of the SNP and I take that responsibility uh, very seriously. Um, the recording of the Westminster Group meeting, um, I think, reveals uh, part of what uh, was wrong uh, in that case. Um, indeed, uh, some of the individuals who were uh, recorded at that meeting have already said this themselves. It demonstrated, uh, and wh I was not at the meeting, so whether uh, this is an accurate overall reflection of the discussion, I can't comment on. But what I have heard uh, suggests that more concern was shown uh, for the perpetrator of this behaviour than was shown for the victim of it. I think that is utterly unacceptable, um, and that is something I uh, will be very clear about. Um, I would repeat the point I made earlier on. Uh, we live in a society uh, now, thankfully, uh, where behaviour of this nature um, is not uh, accepted uh, and is not uh, rightly brushed under the carpet in the way uh, that it used to be. Um, I am sure uh, everybody in this chamber uh, remembers uh, the two years, uh, I think it was in total, uh, that I uh, was subjected uh, to pretty uh, gruelling investigations over separate uh, instances uh, that I would argue uh, came about because uh, I refused to brush certain things uh, under the carpet. It is important uh, that there is transparency and that it is important uh, that any organisation facing these issues uh, reflects uh, and fully faces up to them. That is what I am going to ensure happens uh, for the SNP. But uh, I will repeat the final point uh, I made, and it will be my final point here as well, Presiding Officer. Uh, all parties have faced this. There are two Westminster by-elections happening uh, today because of uh, behaviour on the part of Conservative uh, MPs. All parties have uh, faced uh, this. All parties have been criticised, including in these uh, cases, uh, for their handling of these matters. Um, and I think it is important for all of us, and I will simply speak for myself, uh, that somebody in my position uh, should not sit in a glass house throwing stones about these things. We should sort these things out when they arise in our own parties. That is what I intend to do for the SNP, and I think it is what all leaders should do uh, when it arises in their parties as well. Douglas Ross. I know the First Minister wants to make this about other parties and other parts of the country, but the fact, the fact, that, we, the fact that we have two by-elections today is because Conservative MPs have been suspended and resigned from Parliament. Patrick Grady has been suspended for 48 hours. Yeah. And the First Minister called the recording of the SNP group meeting utterly unacceptable. But that has been public for almost a week, and this is the first we are hearing from the First Minister about it. And her, well, her apology will be welcome, but the victim this morning rejected Ian Blackford's apology. He called it a cop-out and a publicity stunt. The victim said that Ian Blackford has only apologised to protect his own position. Again, quoting the victim directly, he said this, It seems like the SNP under Ian Blackford at Westminster has not learned a thing, and they are still trying to close ranks and discredit the victim by not really addressing any of the issues. He added, nobody can really seriously believe they are going to make improvements to the procedure as long as Ian Blackford is still in post. The First Minister has to answer that charge. And this is a, a deep systemic problem in the governing party here in Scotland, and it is an all too familiar tale. Last year, in similar circumstances, Nicola Sturgeon stood up and said in this chamber, and I quote, It will be a priority for me, for as long as I am First Minister, to ensure that lessons are learned and the trust is re-established, so that anyone who considers in the future that they have suffered sexual harassment has the confidence to come forward and knows that their concerns will be listened to and addressed. First Minister, listening to your own words from a year ago and the victim's words today, 
Isn't it the case that no lessons have been learned? First Minister. Uh, no, that's not uh, the case, and I stand by every single word that has just been quoted. Uh, so, obviously, the issue we're discussing today, the particular issue we're discussing today, is not uh, a Scottish Government issue, it's an SNP uh, issue. But in the Scottish Government, we have a new complaints process in place that was put in place uh, after a very elaborate consultation with trade unions to ensure uh, that we have a process in place uh, that people do have confidence in uh, and uh, feel that they are able uh, to use. It is important that we reflect um, on this situation to ensure that if there are changes need needing to be made uh, to the process, uh, these changes are made. In terms of sanction, as I said, an independent process uh, investigated this in detail and recommended the sanction uh, that it considered uh, was appropriate in uh, this case. That is an independent process that all parties uh, are signed up to uh, and I think all parties uh, should respect. The last point, presiding officer, I would make is this. Um, you know, Douglas Ross will characterise uh, what I say in whatever uh, way he chooses. That is uh, up to him. But I, I think people listening uh, will hear me take these issues extremely uh, seriously. Um, I don't think they will have heard me try to make it all about other parties. But what they will have heard me say um, is something that I think all of us should reflect on. Because if we, any of us, if I was standing here saying the SNP has got no issues here, it's all about the Conservatives or, or Labour, I would be uh, showing that I did not understand the systemic nature of these issues. And if Douglas Ross, uh, he is absolutely uh, rightly raising these issues with me when they arise with the SNP, but if he's really saying that this is somehow a problem uniquely for the SNP, then I would argue he is demonstrating that he doesn't understand the systemic, society-wide uh, nature of these issues. So I will take these issues very seriously whenever it is the Scottish Government or the SNP uh, that is accused uh, of having people that have behaved inappropriately. Um, as I said a moment ago, um, I went through some of the most difficult times of uh, my whole time in politics because I wasn't prepared uh, to have allegations made against somebody who had been very close to me simply swept under the carpet. It's really important that all of us face up to this. Uh, for my part, I will, and I would encourage everybody else to do likewise. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Uh, Officer, last week, an investigation in the UK Parliament was made public. And it concluded that a senior SNP MP was guilty of making an unwanted sexual advance to a teenage member of staff. Now, the First Minister, in response to Douglas Ross, has just said that it was right that those investigations were published and, and it was right and proper. Uh, over a month ago, I asked the First Minister to make public the outcome of investigations against ministers in her own government. She refused, instead claiming that it couldn't be revealed due to GDPR. This despite the SNP rightly demanding the publication of investigations against Preeti Patel. The investigations of that were made public. The outcome of the investigation into Patrick Grady was made public by the UK Parliament. Why won't the First Minister make public outcomes of investigations by the Scottish Government into the conduct of Scottish Ministers? Or don't the Scottish people deserve the same transparency? First Minister. Um, yes, I do think uh, people deserve transparency, and I'm actually grateful uh, to Anna Sarwar for raising this, because it gives me the opportunity to update uh, on what I said uh, when he last raised this issue uh, with me. What I said in the chamber then uh, is true. Uh, it is absolutely the case that we are limited uh, in terms of what we can publish uh, by legal requirements, uh, data protection and confidentiality uh, issues. Uh, that is not uh, a situation that I am comfortable with. Um, I wasn't comfortable with it, um, as probably people could see when I answered these questions before uh, the last time I was asked about it. Uh, therefore, um, as a result of that, I sought uh, further advice. Uh, I asked for advice on whether in future uh, there would be ways of making it possible uh, for us to report publicly the outcome of complaints involving ministers. And if there was a way of doing that, without breaching the legal requirements that I have referred to. Uh, the advice I have uh, now uh, only uh, very recently had is that while we cannot apply this uh, retrospectively, uh, there uh, is uh, a way to do that uh, in relation to future complaints. So I can confirm to the Chamber uh, that that will involve changes uh, to the Ministerial Code uh, and uh, probably also to uh, the complaints procedure that is in place, but work is now underway to make the necessary changes uh, to facilitate that happening in future. 
Anna Sarwell. Well, look, I, I welcome that response from the First Minister, but it's convenient that that response talks about future investigations and not previous investigations. And let's take the advice of Nick McCarroll, the law lecturer at Glasgow University, who said in response to this, as public officials, ministers would expect all their activity and decisions to be open to scrutiny. Even in the realm of employment law, this would be the case. Clearly legal experts, and the First Minister has a law degree, used to be a solicitor, she should know this. Even legal experts believe there is not a case to hide behind GDPR here. No one is asking to publish personal details of the victim, but it is perfectly reasonable to ask the Scottish Government to make clear the outcome of investigations against Scottish ministers. Because a pattern has emerged when it comes to the SNP, close ranks, do as little as you can, and hope the difficult questions go away. On Sunday, Angus Robertson described an SNP MP making unwanted sexual advances towards a teenager as not career-ending. We heard a leaked recording where SNP MPs were cheering and applauding Ian Blackford's call for them to rally round Patrick Grady. The SNP chief whip then threatened legal action against whistleblowers. Support for the perpetrator, no support for the victim. So, First Minister, do you agree with Ian Blackford and your SNP MPs? Do you agree with the words of Angus Robertson? And do you agree with your SNP Chief Whip that it is more important to protect the SNP than to protect the victim? First Minister. Nobody uh, has said uh, that it is more important to protect the, the SNP uh, than it is to protect uh, the victim. I think I have made uh, my views today uh, very clear that support for victims um, of sexual harassment must uh, come first. If that uh, does not happen um, and if a victim uh, feels uh, that they have not been supported, then the obligation is on the organisation, and in this case that is the SNP, to reflect on that, not somehow suggest that it is the victim that is at fault. And I could not be clearer about that. Um, I uh, want uh, to have the conversation uh, directly with the victim in this case to make sure I have got uh, as deep a poss as possible an understanding uh, of exactly uh, the experience in that case uh, so that I can reflect on what changes are needed, and I do not in any way uh, shy away from that. Um, in relation to the, the wider issue, I, I yes, of course, do have a law degree. Uh, not only that, uh, Nick McCarroll and I were in the same uh, class at Glasgow University when we studied uh, law. He obviously has uh, a wealth of expertise, but I, of course, uh, have to uh, rely on uh, the advice uh, that I get as First Minister. That advice in uh, this respect, in terms of retrospective uh, situations, uh, is clear. Uh, but I was not prepared uh, to accept uh, without challenging uh, that uh, for the future. Uh, that is why I sought further advice. It is why I asked for uh, advice on the ways in which we could uh, be consistent with our legal, legal obligations, but also consistent with what I believe is an important obligation, that of transparency. And that is why we will move now forward, uh, forward now to make <coughs> necessary changes to the ministerial code and to the, the procedure uh, to allow uh, information to be published in future. So I, I think um, it is important uh, in any uh, situation like this that somebody in my position takes these things seriously. I am doing that uh, and I will make whatever changes is necessary uh, to get to a position uh, for my uh, party and for my government where we live up to the standards that all of us um, expect. And I think every organisation, including all political parties, have a duty to do likewise. Anna Sarwar. Officer, I can only imagine Nicola Sturgeon's response if the Tories were making that same defence of Preeti Patel in terms of her allegations as she is making of Scottish ministers here uh, in this parliament. Uh, but going back to the Patrick Grady incident, uh, this incident happened six years ago and only now there is talk of change. In those six years, Patrick Grady has been an SNP candidate twice, he has been promoted to Chief Whip and actually led a debate on harassment while being investigated for harassment. It has taken the victim going to the press for this First Minister to talk about taking action, an all too familiar story when it comes to the SNP. Because, Presiding Officer, after 15 years in government, there is a culture of secrecy and cover up at the heart of this government. This is a First Minister who is unforgiving when it comes to her opponents or anyone who disagrees with her, but expects forgiveness from everyone else. In 2002, Nicola Sturgeon said of the then government that they have been in power for so long that they no longer think they are accountable to anybody. There could be no better description for this government. Why does Nicola Sturgeon believe 
It is one standard for her and another standard for everyone else. First Minister. The, the reality is I, I don't. Um, and of course, uh, how long any party remains in government in Scotland, in the UK, in any, uh, well, most uh, other countries in the world is entirely down to the electorate. That will be true uh, of my government, just as it is for any other government in the UK. Um, in terms of uh, what Anna Sarwar describes as a pattern, I, I just don't think uh, that in uh, any way is substantiated. I uh, have answered questions uh, in this chamber in other cases uh, where I have uh, been absolutely very clear uh, that I would not brush things under the carpet or be defensive when it came uh, to reflecting on and facing up to changes. Um, I uh, refused to brush things under the carpet when allegations were made about somebody uh, who was closer to me in politics than anybody else uh, had been. I was subjected to uh, rigorous investigations. Many people in this chamber talked about it in terms of being career-ending uh, for me. Uh, would I uh, do anything uh, different? Obviously, I would learn lessons from that process uh, based on uh, everything we know about it. But would I change uh, the judgment I made that it is important not to brush these things under the carpet, that it is important to face up to them? No, I wouldn't. So I'm not going to stand here. Uh, and perhaps this is uh, what... Uh, distinguishes me from some other politicians in some other places. I'm not going to stand here and defend the indefensible. Uh, I'm going to say if things uh, are wrong, if things uh, represent failures and processes, then I'm going to take the action to put them right. Just as the Scottish Government did uh, when these issues were raised about the Scottish Government, I will make sure it happens with the SNP as well. Question number three, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. I am very grateful for that reply. Presiding Officer, the crisis in our NHS is directly linked to what is going on right now in social care. Top doctors are saying delayed discharges are the worst that they have ever seen. There are currently 1,800 patients well enough to leave hospital, but who can't in large part because there is no care package to help them home. Presiding officer, that is the equivalent of all of the patients in Caithness General, Borders General, the Sick Kids, DGRI and Edinburgh Royal Infirmary put together. The government solution to this is a ministerial takeover of social care, which my party has opposed from the start. Remember, it was SNP ministers who discharged COVID-positive patients into our care homes. We can't afford to wait four years for the wrong solution. This crisis is at our gates right now. So can I ask the First Minister, why won't she meet that crisis now with proper pay, fair conditions and local reform? First Minister. Uh, well I think it is right to move towards uh, a national care service and of course this parliament uh, will scrutinise and debate uh, the legislation uh, that has been put forward. This is about improving the quality uh, of services, it is about improving the consistency of services and yes it is about improving uh, the terms and conditions of those who work in our social care uh, sector. But we are not waiting uh, in order to establish a national care service uh, to make these improvements now. So we are already increasing uh, the wages of those who work in uh, the adult social care uh, sector. In April uh, this year, the minimum hourly rate uh, increased, um, and this represents uh, a 12.9 per cent increase for these workers in just over a year for a full-time adult social care worker that represents an uplift of over £1,600 over the course of the financial year. These are minimum rates of pay. Of course, many employers uh, will pay more than these minimums. So on that, we are taking action uh, now. And of course, in the overall funding of social care, we are taking action. We are in the process uh, over this parliament of increasing funding for social care by 25%. Uh, that is in the region of £800 million. Um, and Parliament will scrutinise the legislation for the National Care uh, Service, but let me just read uh, the views uh, of some uh, this week uh, to the publication of that uh, legislation. Uh, Carer Scotland's uh, director, we welcome the publication of this new bill, not least uh, that it sets out in legislation rights for carers 
uh, Tommy Whitelaw, uh, national lead on caring uh, for Alliance Scotland, really looking forward to the co-design of the National Care Service, uh, the Carers Coalition, uh, the introduction of the right to short breaks uh, is very welcome. Um, carer voices, uh, similar comments. Uh, so there is uh, broad-based support, I think, for this, but it is important we get the detail right. That's what the parliamentary process is for, but it's also what the co-design process uh, is intended to deliver as well. We'll now move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Alistair Allen. Essential infrastructure works are due to start on Uig Harbour this October. Interim arrangements put forward by CalMac would see the removal of all the ferry services to Tarbert and the loss of a third of the capacity to Loch Maddy during the six-month closure period. Given that there are still a great many unknowns and unresolved issues, what, consider what consideration has the Scottish Government given to the option of postponing the works until viable interim arrangements can be put in place? First Minister. I know the Transport Minister is very aware of the concerns that communities have in relation to the planned Uig Harbour closure. Um, this is a project that is ultimately led by Highland Council, uh, but the Transport Minister has agreed, uh, I understand, to meet with Alistair Allen in addition to meeting with the uh, Community Board to discuss what further mitigations uh, we might be able to to support. Uh, the suggestion to postpone the port closure and delay the completion of works is an option which continues to be considered, but it does come uh, with considerable risks. Uh, the clear focus of the project remains the safe and efficient replacement uh, of infrastructure that is life expired, uh, to use the, the technical term, and improvement of capacity, reliability and resilience of the port at UVIG for the longer term benefit of routes to the Western Isles. Sue Weber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, my constituent Samantha received a letter from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care on the 20th of June, stating his reassurance that both the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland remain committed to ensuring women who have experienced complications as a result of transvaginal mesh have access to the best possible care. This left Samantha upset and lost for words. She told me, and I quote, I was heartbroken when I tried to access this care, only for my hospital gynaecology department to tell me the NHS would not honour most of the measures. They were unwilling to refer me to the Glasgow unit and scared me half to death by saying people like me will never be 100% mesh free. It is as if they are trying to put us off mesh removal surgery. First Minister, you stated that we will do everything possible to get these women the treatment and the care that they need. Where is the evidence that this is happening? First Minister. Uh, there is a, a wealth, uh, are, uh, a wealth of measures that have been taken to improve the experience uh, of women who have suffered because uh, of mesh, uh, and that includes, uh, for example, a complex pelvic uh, mesh removal service. Um, and we continue uh, to take forward changes uh, to improve that experience and ensure that women do have access to the treatment they need. Um, I have uh, previously met uh, with groups of women. Uh, I did so uh, with the, uh, the, the then uh, Chief Medical Officer and the then uh, Health Secretary and continue to be committed to taking forward all uh, of these changes. Um, obviously, I am not aware uh, of Samantha's uh, particular uh, circumstances, nor have I seen the letter uh, that she received from the Health Secretary, but I am happy to look at that. Um, and if we can provide further information that would be of assistance to Samantha, uh, I am happy to ensure that that is done. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister must agree that it is totally unacceptable for freight capacity to US to be cut by a third during the six months when the UIG Harbour is closed for redevelopment. There is a solution. It is possible to put in place a temporary link span during this time. So will she commit to that today to make sure that ferries can operate to their normal timetable while the harbour is being redeveloped? First Minister. Um, I won't repeat everything I've said to Alistair Allen, um, except to say, firstly, I understand uh, the importance of this issue, and I, I do understand the concerns uh, that communities have. I, I'm not going to commit today to a particular solution uh, without the proper consideration uh, that that would require um, and merit. But as I said in my answer to Alistair Allen, uh, any options and solutions that are put forward will be properly considered. Um, that is why the Transport Minister has agreed to meet uh, not just with Alistair Allen but with the Ferry Community Board. So uh, any possible mitigations uh, that the Government might be able to support uh, will be properly considered. And on the specific one that she has put forward, when that consideration has uh, happened, I'm happy to ask the Transport Minister uh, to feedback directly to her. Fiona Hislop. 
With uh, British Railways in chaos, an RMT representative has referred to Westminster Tory government's intransigence by saying, and I repeat the quote, perhaps the UK government should take a feather out of the Scottish government's hat and actually propose a 5% along with a five-year no compulsory redundancy agreement. Does the First Minister recall that some weeks ago at First Minister's questions, I warned of the UK government's deeply damaging approach to industrial relations, and now we learn it is proposing to legislate to allow use of agency workers during a legally balloted strike action. Does the First Minister share my view that this is dangerous Tory ideology designed to inflame rather than resolve this extremely damaging dispute? First Minister. I do, I do recall very well uh, Fiona Hislop uh, warning um, about the dangers of this dispute uh, escalating if it was not uh, resolved. And of course, people across the UK are paying the price for that uh, right now. Uh, they're paying the price uh, for the Tory uh, anti-trade union rhetoric. In fact, the uh, Tory uh, anti-trade unionism, uh, which I completely uh, deprecate. We should respect uh, workers across our economy, we should respect uh, public sector workers and we should seek uh, to negotiate fair resolutions uh, to disputes, uh, particularly at a time of soaring inflation, inflation being so exacerbated in the UK, uh, of course, by the folly of Brexit. Uh, the real strike that is crippling the UK right now is not the result of a dispute with ScotRail. Um, it is a dispute with Network Rail and with uh, English train operating companies. Uh, therefore, it is entirely a reserved matter. Um, the other thing I remember from a few weeks ago in this chamber, uh, when there uh, was the potential for a ScotRail dispute, uh, Tory MSPs getting up and demanding intervention from this government to resolve it. Uh, so let me uh, repeat the call today for the UK government to start doing their job. Thank you to get round the table to bring a resolution to this and to drop their anti-trade unionism and show some respect for workers across the economy. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. Last week, the Courier's headline, Dundee killer Robbie McIntosh to get parole hearing this summer, related to a murderer who, whilst on home leave from serving a life sentence in 2017, carried out a brutal attempt to murder a random lone female dog walker in Templeton Woods in Dundee. In October 2017, he was sentenced to a lifelong restriction order with a minimum of five years before being considered for release on licence. Now we learn this dangerous individual will be given a parole hearing on or around August the 8th, the day after the anniversary of the attack and less than five years from sentencing. First Minister, what message does this send to women like the victim of this shocking attack, other than that this government's justice system will not protect you? First Minister. Uh, can I, firstly, before responding to the question, acknowledge uh, again uh, Mrs Macdonald's bravery in continuing to raise uh, these issues. Um, and I know she wants to ensure that all parties uh, learn from this case, uh, and certainly that is what I uh, want to see and I'm determined to see as well. Uh, there, of course, was a significant case review uh, into uh, this matter. The Scottish Government and the SPS accepted uh, all of the recommendations uh, for them in uh, that significant case review, and the Scottish Prison Service has taken a range of action already uh, to respond to those recommendations. Uh, home leave for prisoners, obviously I'm uh, not talking uh, about this particular case at the moment, I'm talking about the general situation. Home leave for prisoners is a necessary and accepted part of the rehabilitation process. Uh, prisoners are subject to assessment and review, and rightly so. Uh, but where uh, a situation arises uh, that shows that this has not uh, gone in the way uh, that it should have done, it is absolutely vital that lessons are learned. In terms of uh, parole hearing, uh, the sentence imposed following the conviction in any case is a matter for a court, uh, and uh, in turn that determines uh, when someone is sentenced to an order for life for long restriction, it may be considered for parole under licence conditions. It is then a matter for the Independent Parole Board uh, to consider uh, when and whether an individual can be released. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the increase in COVID-19 cases, 
What measures the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that everyone eligible for the spring booster vaccine receives it? First Minister. As of 20 June, 91% of those aged 75 and over and 86% of elderly care home residents have received a fourth dose of the COVID vaccine, uh, the majority of which have been administered as part of the spring booster programme. Uh, and I want to again express my gratitude to all NHS staff and partners who have helped achieve uh, that uptake. Uh, we have been working closely with health boards to encourage uptake and have introduced a range of outreach activities to build trust or remove barriers for people who might not otherwise take up the vaccination offer. Uh, these include uh, using mobile outreach units provided by the ambulance service, creating COVID sense posters uh, in multiple languages and formats, and developing a culturally sensitive vaccine explainer video informed by insights from organisations representing different communities. Uh, given the current high number of cases uh, that we are uh, experiencing right now, I would again take the opportunity to urge all those eligible for the vaccine, including from the spring booster, to come forward and get that protection. Christine Graham. Um, I thank the First Minister for a detailed answer. And as someone who's had her spring booster, um, I would indeed uh, endorse the statement she's made, and especially as we see cases now rising. Now, further to that, with cases reportedly at 1 in 30, and undoubtedly that's an understatement, and hospital admissions rising, we can all see where we might be headed if we throw caution to the winds. And I'm as sick of restrictions as an ex-person, but what should we be doing as individuals, and in fact in commercial situations, what, we should be do what should we be doing to try to nip this in the bud and not head towards a restrictive winter? First Minister. Well, we are see, seeing a, a rising trend of cases at the moment. Uh, we consider that that is being uh, driven by the BA4 and BA5 uh, subvariants uh, of Omicron. Um, and it is important that we continue to monitor that, and the Scottish Government will continue to monitor that very closely. None of us uh, want to see a return to uh, restrictions of uh, any uh, nature. Uh, we're not, uh, at this stage, seeing uh, the translation uh, of cases into uh, hospital uh, cases in the way we did at earlier stages of the pandemic, particularly before vaccination. But that does not mean uh, that this illness is mild uh, for everyone. Having recently uh, had uh, COVID, uh, it is a nasty uh, virus and can affect people seriously. So Christine Graham is right uh, to remind us that it is important to continue to take precautions to try to uh, limit the potential for transmission uh, of the virus. And it is important, above all, if you are eligible for any dose of the vaccine and you haven't yet had that dose of the vaccine, to get it, because it does provide significant protection against serious illness. Jackie Bailey. COVID cases have been rising. Hospital admissions are rising too, and long COVID cases are going up. It is over six months since many people have had their third vaccination, including people who are in the shielding category because of their health condition. So protection from vaccination is now waning. Will the First Minister bring forward the autumn vaccination programme to this summer, given that we are facing another wave of COVID infection? And in light of the press conference held by Long COVID Scotland today, what urgent action will she take to improve services and research for the condition. First Minister. Firstly, on vaccination, um, we continue to monitor very carefully, informed uh, by expert scientific and uh, clinical opinion, uh, the effects of vaccination. I think it is important to be responsible about the, the terminology and the language uh, we use um, about uh, the impact of vaccination. Um, in terms of the timing and uh, the coverage of any uh, vaccination programme or phase of a vaccination programme, and this applies to uh, the autumn campaign, uh, we will continue to be guided uh, by the advice and recommendations of the JCVI. Um, I think that is the responsible thing uh, to do. Uh, this government has acted quickly to ensure that recommended uh, vaccination gets to all eligible people as quickly as possible, and we will continue to do that. Uh, on long COVID, uh, we are investing uh, this year, of course, to support NHS boards and partners to improve the care and support available for people uh, with long COVID. Uh, so, for example, the investment we are making uh, will enable boards to introduce care coordinator roles uh, so that there is a single point of contact for people with long COVID. COVID. Uh, it will provide extra resource to support person-centred thorough assessments 
of the needs of people with long COVID uh, to make sure that they can then be supported to access the most appropriate support uh, for them. And it will provide additional capacity for community rehabilitation services uh, to support people suffering from long COVID with the issues that affect their day-to-day -day lives. Question number five, Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of reports that incidents of bullying in NHS Scotland have risen by nearly 50 per cent in five years. First Minister. Uh, bullying is always unacceptable. Uh, we want people uh, to have avenues available within health boards to raise any experiences uh, or concerns that they have. Uh, that is why a new bullying policy was introduced in 2020 to ensure that more support was available. Uh, the Government uh, also commissioned John Sturrock QC to review the culture in NHS Highland in particular. One outcome of that was the establishment of a ministerial working group to examine the issues of culture more broadly. Uh, and uh, that uh, is work that happened uh, previously uh, that was uh, impacted, of course, uh, by COVID. However, I can confirm today that we are now developing a new national leadership development programme for health uh, social work and social care sectors uh, to carry this work on and help foster uh, an open uh, and welcoming uh, and supportive culture in the NHS where all staff are valued and treated with dignity and respect. Tess White. First Minister, in the North East, the picture is particularly alarming, with reported cases having tripled in NHS Tayside and doubled in NHS Grampian. These cases will have had a deeply damaging effect on the mental health of staff at a time when recruitment and retention are an endemic issue in our NHS. The First Min Mi Minister mentions the Sturrock Review. What assessment has been made that lessons from the Sturrock Review into bullying in NHS Highland have been implemented by health boards? And what urgent steps is the Scottish Government taking to ensure that health boards foster an open and tolerant workplace culture going forwards. First Minister. Before I uh, come back again to the very serious issue that is being raised here, uh, let me acknowledge that recruitment is a challenge in the National Health Service, as it is in many parts of our public services and indeed our economy more generally. And one of the reasons that recruitment uh, is such a challenge, of course, and it's appropriate to say this, this is six years to the day since the Brexit referendum, is because of Brexit, the ending of free movement, for example. And these issues uh, should remind us all of that uh, folly, and I hope it particularly reminds Conservatives uh, of that. Um, on the issues uh, in terms of bullying within the National Health Service, we should all uh, be very clear uh, that bullying is unacceptable. It has no place anywhere. It certainly has no place in the National Health Service, and we should uh, unite as politicians to send that message uh, loudly and clearly. Um, in terms of John Sturrock's review of cultural issues in NHS Highland, this goes to the specific question that was raised. Uh, the Health Secretary asked all health boards to consider the recommendations, uh, review their internal assurance mechanisms, uh, and advise the Government of actions that they have undertaken. Um, we will continue to monitor progress on that closely, and as I said in my original answer, we are also developing a new national leadership development programme uh, that will launch later this year. Edward Mount. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, in the last Parliament, you agreed, or your government agreed, to debate the Sturrock Report. You did, in fact, agree in this Parliament to debate the Sturrock Report. Do you think the fact that you haven't hasn't helped this bullying going on in NHS and that you should now fulfil your promise and provide that time as you've undertaken twice before? First Minister. I'm certainly happy to consider uh, government time for that. Of course, opposition parties can choose to debate in their time any issue that they, they want to debate. Um, I uh, think it's important uh, that we have vigorous uh, and robust debate in this Parliament, but I think it is more important on, uh, or as important on these issues that we ensure the recommendations uh, from John Sturrock's review uh, are actually implemented, which is uh, why the work that I referred to in my earlier answer is uh, so important. Uh, these issues uh, do matter. It is vital that everybody who works in our National Health Service um, has a, a culture that supports them, uh, not one uh, that in any way uh, allows them to be bullied or intimidated. And John Sturrock's recommendations uh, certainly will help ensure that that is the case. Question number six, Carol Mockham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Scottish Government plans to appoint a women's health champion in light of the appointment of a women's health ambassador for England. 
First Minister. Uh, we will be appointing a women's health uh, champion or ambassador uh, this summer. Uh, this will be an important step in the delivery of our Women's Health Plan, uh, which of course was the first Women's Health Plan published by any government in the UK. Uh, I understand that the UK government is still developing its Women's Health Strategy for England uh, and that the Welsh Government has committed to drafting a Women's Health Plan, but that uh, has not yet been done. Uh, through the Scottish Plan, we have prioritised improving services and information for uh, women, including initiating new research on endometriosis, launching a new women's health platform on NHS Inform, and increasing the choices that women have to access contraception at community pharmacies. Carol Mockin. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Women across Scotland face the significant challenge of health inequalities on a daily basis. For many women, these inequalities can define their lives, in some, in some cases simply because they are women, and in others because they are women who live in areas with higher levels of deprivation. It is clear that the women need many of the short and medium-term actions in the Women's Health Plan, and, and I thank the Minister for confirming that the appointment will be made. If the First Minister truly recognises the urgency of this matter, Will she give women across Scotland the answer that they not only want but need and ensure that the appointment will be meaningful and will take forward the important short-term actions from the Women's Health Plan which have not been forthcoming so far? First Minister. Um, yes, the appointment will be meaningful. I'm not entirely sure uh, what is intended by, by that question. Uh, of course it will be meaningful. Uh, anybody appointed to this role um, will, uh, will, will have expertise uh, that is required. Um, it is important that we take forward um, all of the uh, action points and, and recommendations in the, the Women's Health Plan. Um, as I said, we were the first government in the UK to produce a Women's Health Plan. Uh, since the launch of the plan, we have seen progress made uh, on a range of actions. The development of the Women's Health Platform uh, on NHS Inform is an important source of information. Uh, the uh, jointly funded uh, research call uh, with jointly funded with well-being of women on endometriosis uh, research is also important. Uh, we have established a menopause specialist network, uh, which is meeting regularly to provide uh, peer support um, and support for primary care teams, uh, something that I think is uh, really important. Uh, we have made progress on access to uh, contraception in uh, pharmacies and uh, action on menstrual health, uh, including uh, menopause, is, is now included in the Scottish curriculum. So a, a range of things have already happened, but it's important that we drive forward all of the recommendations in this, which is why the appointment of a women's health champion is such a key part of it. Um, and as I said in my original answer, uh, that appointment will happen this summer. I'll return briefly to General and constituency supplementary questions. Take one final question from Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday in the Commons, the Deputy Prime Minister laid out his plans for a so-called British Bill of Rights. In reality, this is a rights removal bill. It would rip up the European Court of Human Rights from domestic law and rewrite the Scotland Act. In their place, we are supposed to rely on Mr Robb's common sense. It becomes clearer every day that only by becoming independent can we build a fairer and more equal Scotland. Will the First Minister join me in opposing these dangerous plans and can she outline what impact this might have on our plans to introduce a Scottish Human Rights Bill during this Parliament? First Minister. I, I could hear the discomfort from the Conservative benches as Maggie Chapman uh, was speaking and I'm, I'm not surprised they're so deeply uh, uncomfortable. Uh, having a UK government that, of course, Scotland did not elect, a UK government that's already taken us out of Brexit against our will, uh, now ripping up, removing, or at the very least diluting human rights, absolutely is yet another argument for Scotland becoming independent. Yeah, yeah. Um, this bill will impact on devolved responsibilities, um, and it is therefore important that the UK government properly consults uh, with us. Uh, I don't hold out much hope of that happening. Um, in reality. Uh, but of course we do have uh, plans ourselves uh, for a human rights bill um, and we uh, remain committed to taking that forward over the course of this parliament. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to members' business.